Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1 uh, is where we will camp out this week and next week. As I said, we're starting a new uh, Christmas series, uh, a little four-week deal. Uh, through. We're going to stay in Luke, and so I'll be in Luke 1, uh, specifically concerning Mary. Uh, and then Luke will spend two weeks in Luke 2. Uh, with the shepherds, and so uh, we've entitled the next couple of weeks of Glad Tidings. Uh, glad Tidings is what uh, the angel tells the shepherds, uh, but it, it, even in Luke 1, uh, with uh, the angel coming uh, to Zechariah, there's a good news that I bring you, and he brings good news to Mary, uh, so good a news that she can't hardly believe it. Uh, and, and a couple, and I can't wait to break that down uh, a little bit. And then next week, like I said, Luke has spent two weeks. And Luke 2 in with the shepherds of the glad tidings. And the glad tidings that we will see is not just something to be received, but it's also be something to be shared. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I won't spend much time on it this morning, but uh, after Mary receives the news uh, that she will... Uh, conceive of a son, call him Jesus. The first thing she does is run to Elizabeth uh, to talk to her because she had heard the news that uh, she had was praised. So she goes to share uh, with the shepherds. They receive the good news, and then they go and share. It's a glad tidings. It's not just something for us to to grab a hold of, but it's something, uh, I think, inherently with it for us to share. It's something that is, is not just it's too good for us to hold on uh, it to ourselves and for ourselves. It has to be shared. Uh, you notice the Christmas decorations that are up already. I want to give a thank you to, to Patty and Liza and Shelby and Brittany Graves and Paul and Sarah. And my wife was here. I was here just chasing kids for a second. Uh, did I miss anybody? Anyway, thank you all so much for the decorations. They look great. Uh, obviously, up front, you probably can tell that's kind of a picture place that you can take pictures. It'll be up for the next few weeks. I uh, think so much. Luke and Lauren uh, went uh, went out of town for the weekend just to get away, uh, so we just took turns. And so I hope they have a. He's been sending me. Imagine this. He's been sending me food pictures all weekend. Uh, and so uh, three meals a day. I know what he's eating, and I got pictures to, uh, uh, to prove it. And so anyway, they've been hanging out. Uh, and they've been having a great time there. When it comes to the text, specifically uh, the story of Gabriel visiting uh, Mary and even the angels in the field with the shepherd, uh, for if you have spent any time in church, or maybe you haven't spent time in church, you've watched any kind of Christmas movies that are from the biblical narrative, oftentimes we can check out because it's like there's nothing that Justin can preach this morning uh, that I haven't heard. And the good news is that's the way it should be. Uh, The preacher should never come up with something that's never been heard, because if that's the case, it's probably not truth, Uh, because we can't just take the biblical text and make it mean what we want to, or try to say, well, you know what, it may have meant that then, this is what it means now. Uh, And so so that's in one sense, uh, the pressure's off of me to come up with something new, because if I do, then I've missed the mark. Uh, And so that's a good thing, but what happens in our minds is, is we check out. It's kind of like watching a movie that we've seen 10 million times that we know all the lines to, uh, and that we, when we check into it, it's like, well, I don't really have to pay attention. I can do all this, that, and the other. I can quote the, I can do all the quotes from the movie, this, that, and the other, and the movie loses its uh, original effect that it had on us. Uh, but the good news is that the Bible's not a movie. Uh, the Bible wasn't was authored by man specifically. It's authored by God, and it says of itself that it's alive and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. Uh, And that though the grass may wither and the flower may fade, that the Word of God will remain forever. Uh, And so that even today, it still will speak just as much to us as it did to Theophilus when Luke wrote it. Uh, That it will speak just as much to us today, even if we've heard this 10 million times. And I'm praying that the Lord, and I'm going to pray over us in a moment, that the Lord would remove any callousness from our eyes and our hearts uh, so that we can hear from him this morning. That we don't check out and go, all right, well, I know this, and so maybe Justin won't preach too long, and we'll go to lunch. 
uh, but that we will ask the Lord uh, to speak to us from the story of when Gabriel came and told Mary for the first time that she was going to give birth to the Savior of the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word to a, I'm thankful that we live in a place that this story is familiar to us. That it won't be the first time we've ever heard, for the most of us, majority of us, the first time we've ever heard of the story of whenever you send Gabriel to talk to a teenager named Mary to tell her of your plan. But God, what I do pray, because your scripture tells us uh, that the human eyes, they're, they're blind and the hearts are callous. And so God, we pray that today that you would open our eyes, that you would soften our hearts, and uh, that we could hear from you, that we could see you and see and be blown away by your great love to interrupt uh, the flow of the world to save a world that turns its back against you. So God, we thank you for this opportunity this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And so what we'll see in this very familiar text this morning is that Mary, uh, some 13 years old, 15 at the oldest, uh, she probably, she had to, we know she had some plans, right? So we knew that she was betrothed, and I'll get to that in a moment. She was betrothed, she was engaged to Joseph. Uh, she probably saw her life and, and had dreams of, of, of when they would actually officially get married, where they would live, maybe what she would do, uh, the kids that she would have. By no means, and there's Joseph on the other side, by no means did she ever think that this was going to happen. But what we see in this text this morning, this this is not about Mary's plans. It's about God's plans and God's timing and God's work, that God is intervening in this world, upsetting schedules and realigning lives, because it's what it took to get his work of redemption accomplished. So let's turn Luke 1, beginning in verse 26, it says this, in the sixth month uh, the sixth month there, Paul's, uh, the, t- the text before this is when uh, Gabriel visits Zechariah and says, your uh, wife Elizabeth will give uh, birth to a son, call him John the Baptist. He will prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, so it's the sixth month of her pregnancy. So uh, she's six months pregnant at this moment. So the sixth month of her pregnancy, uh, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. Say sent from God. Uh, so the, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying. If you have if you mark in your Bible, just underline at the saying there. What was she troubled by at the saying? And we'll kind of unpack that in a moment. And try to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, Well, how would this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her uh, who was called barren. For nothing, everybody say nothing. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of God. And this morning, as we look to the text, there are four. I want to break it down in four points. The first one is the divine messenger. Secondly, we'll see the divine message. Third, the divine plan and power. And lastly, the response to that divine 
uh, response to the device. Number one, if you're taking notes, there's the divine messenger that shows up on the scene. We see that in verses 26 and 27. Sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, uh, the angel Gabriel. We've already met Gabriel. He's not speaking, uh, spoke of a lot, but if you go to uh, the beginning of chapter one, it was Gabriel who met with Zechariah. And Gabriel actually says about himself in verse 19 to Zechariah. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And so we understand that there's a divine messenger that was sent, and the Bible says to Galilee, uh, the city of Galilee, a city of Galilee named Nazareth. What we see in this text is that God first initiates his plan by sending his word. That the Christmas story, this story, by the way, I titled this sermon, uh, The God of the Impossible, the whole situation seems impossible. Galilee was, or, or Nazareth was a podunk town that had literally, uh, for somebody to be a Nazarene, they would literally call him a no-name. Uh, so when they said Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus the no-name, uh, literally what it meant. And so God sends his messenger, Gabriel, one of his chief messengers, is sent to Nazareth, and it's an insignificant village in Galilee. That God can work through places and people the world may overlook. So not only did the messenger come to some remote village, some 70 miles north of Jerusalem, listen to me, that the Old Testament never even mentions. Not only that, but it says that he came to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Luke includes Joseph of the house of David because there are prophecy in which from, from the house of David will become the Messiah. But it comes to a woman, a virgin betrothed. The betrothed there is engaged. And so back then, the way that uh, marriage took place, it was an arranged marriage. The, the father of the bride uh, would pick the groom. Uh, and I'm, now that I have two girls, I'm in favor of installing this back. <clears throat> Uh, that, that, uh, cause it, not only that, I hear you popping, uh, not only that, not only would I get to choose who Evie and Emma marry, but in that world, he would be losing somebody to help in the house. And so guess what the father of the groom did? Would pay the father of the bride to take to, for replacement of him. And so I'm like, let's do this. Uh, not only do I get to pick the one, but anyway. So this process that happened for Mary, she was betrothed. She wasn't. So the first step was the engagement, and this were, and this is when that pro- began to happen. And eventually, they would uh, get married and then consummate their marriage. And so that part hasn't happened yet because the Bible says she's still a virgin. But we know that the the agreement has taken place between the fathers, uh, and so therefore she knows who he will be. But that's. That's all we know, that she was a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph from the house of David. God chooses Mary not for her prominence or achievements, but as a demonstration of his sovereign grace to enact his sovereign plan. Mary brought nothing to the table. And here's what Luke and I talked about a few weeks ago. Because we're Baptist, uh, there are two figures or people in the Bible that we shy away from. The first one is the Holy Spirit because he makes us feel uncomfortable. The second is Mary because of the Roman Catholic view of Mary. We oftentimes, well, we don't, we don't want to talk about Mary. We don't want to make much of her and that kind of deal. And that's not our goal. But the reality is, is she is the woman that the God of the universe chose to, to bear the, the son of God. And so while we value her, we do not worship to her. We do not worship her or pray to her. We do see the significance that, man, it was nothing about her, but God in his sovereign grace chose that she would be the one who would bear the son of man. And so the divine messenger comes to this random place, I don't want to say what I thought, like town locally, because you may be there, but anytime I think of a, I always say Bucatana, right? And so Bucatana, uh, or you fill in a blank, whatever came to your mind, random, didn't come to Jerusalem, wasn't sent to Rome, 
He was sent to this no-name place 70 miles north of Jerusalem to a 13-year-old girl who really didn't have any life figured out other than she knew who she was going to marry. God sent his messenger. And just a, a point of application here is that there are often times in our life where we feel maybe overlooked or insignificant. Like there, there are, or maybe even in our life, there are things that we deal with in our life that we think, ah, that's not a big deal. It's, not, it's insignificant. It's, it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't matter much. There's not a lot of weight to it. Remember just from this story that God often chooses the humble and unseen to fulfill his purposes. And that's just a direct application to this, that we're, now, we're not married by any means, but Man, God, and that's what, that's what, that's what the, not only was the mystery of the incarnate or the, the mystery of God's redemptive plan, like, not only was it a mystery, like, blew our minds because the very fact that, that God would take on flesh and become man, but that he would do it through humility and poverty. That he would do it through no names and nowhere. That he wouldn't come and be born of, the religious Jewish elite that had power and authority, that lived in Jerusalem, but he would do it through some no-name, backwoods, redneck that didn't have much to offer. Man, the mystery and the brilliance of our God. Because starting off, it teaches us that riches and success, and accolades does not allow you to enter into the kingdom. It's not authority and power. It's not in reputation or prestige. But God chose the foolish to humble the proud. He chose the small to bring down the mighty. And we'll get to that in Mary's Magnificat, where she actually sings that part of what the Lord has done. The second thing we see, the divine messenger had a divine message, and this divine message was twofold. And I will say this, the majority of the divine message had nothing to do with Mary. It was about Jesus, the one that she would bear. But there is something, maybe you didn't catch it, maybe you did because I told you to underline it. Uh, but look at it. Look at verse 28 again. And he came to her and said, greetings. Literally, could you imagine, hello? Uh, <clears throat> as ultimately, that, it translates hello. It, it's greetings. Hello, how are you? Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. The, the oh, favored one is literally highly favored. The, the angel Gabriel shows up to this 13-year-old girl and says, Hello, oh, 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 favored one, oh, highly favored to God. God is with you. The Lord is with you. And you would think that that is what would make her shrink back. You would think that was what made her freak out and not what was going on. But look to the text again. It says in verse 28, But she was greatly troubled at what? The saying. What was the saying? Oh, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Maybe you aren't clicking that same cylinder with me right now. It wasn't the fact that an angel spoke to her that freaked her out. It was what the angel said to her that made her lose, like, what's going on? And what he said to her was, oh, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Remember how I said the title of this text, The God of the Impossible? It should blow our minds like it did Mary. Not only would an angel appear, but the angel would appear and says, man, God has favored, has found favor in you. That God has decided to point his grace towards you, and he is with you. You see the humility of this 13-year-old girl. She was more surprised that God had found favor with her and was with her than there was actually an angel speaking to her. You're highly favored. That's what greatly troubled her. And there's this humility whenever she understood, because I think she knew herself and like thinking, okay, 
why, how, why, how, how have I found favor with the Lord and what have I done that he is with me? You see the humility and maybe that needs to check us for a little while. When it comes to the thought that, that we have found grace, that God has bestowed grace upon us as if we are We should be recipients of that. We went to church with Ashley's grandmother when we were in Texas, and one of the things the pastor said is the worst thing that we should want is for God to give us what we deserve. That's the last thing we should want. Mary had done nothing for the favor of the Lord to be placed upon her. Mary had done nothing for the, for the Lord to be with her. And just like Mary, neither have you and I. We not, may not be the ones who are, are going to bear or bore the, the, the Son of God. But we're still sinners just like Mary was. And Mary was greatly troubled, not that there was just an angel, but the reality that she was highly favored before the Lord. That was the first part of the divine message. The second part focused on Jesus. Here it is. <clears throat> she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. There it is again. You have found favor with God. And here's the, here's the divine message. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. Now she's like, all right, wait, wait, hold on. She, Will's already clicking, I'm not married yet. And so go into their, into their context. Like, this was like the ultimate, like, no, no. Like, marriage, it would, she, she would be publicly humiliated. And actually, because who was going to believe that she hadn't, she was still a virgin, and here she is pregnant, and who's actually going to believe this? So she ultimately faced uh, losing uh, Joseph losing her family, being alienated in front of society, and even potentially even being stoned for adultery. Not only that, she's only 13. Where's her future and her goals and her plans and everything she had thought of? We never think about that with Mary. I don't know what a, a 13-year-old Jewish girl dreamed of, but I'm sure she had aspirations and hopes and desires, and maybe it was just to be Joseph. I don't know what it was. But as soon as this happens, everything changes. Everything. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. At that moment, maybe something started switching. Because we can tell by her song at the end of Luke 1, she was very familiar with the Jewish passages, and definitely the Psalms. So she would have been familiar with the Old Testament. She would have been familiar with the name Joshua and Jesus. Like she would have been familiar with these terms. And so his message, firstly, was about his name, the son's name. His son's, the son's name was going to be Jesus. It wasn't going to be some random Joe Blow out from back here. His name was going to be Jesus, which literally means the Lord saves. You're going to call him Jesus, and his name, the, the name he will bear, literally means the Lord saves. Not only did the angel tell him his name, but his identity. He bear a son, you should call his name Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Remember, we, we're 2,000 years plus removed. This, like, think about it in real time. All right, 13-year-old Mary, you found favor. The Lord is with you. You're going to bear a son, and his name's going to be Jesus, and he's going to be great. And he's going to be called Son of the Most High, which speaks, and we'll see it later on when Angel, Angel, Gabriel speaks again, but here in this and, and about Jesus, we get his name, his identity, and this great in the Son of the Most High, it affirms that his nature, his nature and his relationship to the Father, that this, 
because she still hasn't heard, well, how is this going to happen when we get out of there? So she knows now that his name is going to be Jesus and that he's going to be the son of the most high, which means he's not necessarily the son of Joseph because he's not the most high. Uh, and so, so she's getting, and so he's going to be ultimately his name and his going to be great. And his greatness is different because if you read about John the Baptist prior to this, uh, it says he would be great before the Lord. Uh, John's greatness was one that was going to be earned. His, Jesus is greatness just because he is. Because of the relationship to the Father, that he's equal with this, the Father, that he is God. But not only that, but his mission. Like, you can think about, like, I don't know how, I don't know if this is everything that was said. This is what, what we have in the text. But, like, did you imagine? Maybe she was asleep, something happened. A, a, Gabriel comes. Hey, you're highly favored. Lord's with you. Uh, you're going to conceive of a son. You're going to name him Jesus, which means he's going to save people from their sins. Uh, he's going to be great and call a son of the living God. But also, he, he is uh, going to sit on the throne of his father, David, and he will, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. There will be no end. And she's like, Right, like, 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 that's what I'm talking about. Like, we get so accustomed to this story that we forget, like, this is happening in real time right here. But it talks about his mission that this, this, this baby that's going to be born, his name's going to be Jesus, but he's going to be different because he's, he's going to be great. And it's not a great that, like, just like people recognize, he's just going to be great because he's great. It's in his nature, and he's going to be called the son of the living God because he, yes, he's going to be man, but he's, but he's God. He's got this unique nature that's going to happen. And, but not only is he just coming to be born, but he's, he's, going to, he's going to sit upon a throne. But his throne is going to be different than any throne you've ever known because it's going to have no end, and it's going to be established forever. See, the Christmas story is not just about a baby being born. Even here, it's about a throne that's going to be occupied for all eternity. And you have a 13-year-old girl trying to wrap her mind around that. And obviously, we understand that even what we looked at in the past couple of weeks is that, that this is partially fulfilled, that there's going to be an eventual fulfillment of this where Christ is seated upon a throne right at the right hand of his Father, but there will be an actual sitting, and we'll, we'll see that that the incarnation fulfilled some it fulfilled prophecy, the Christmas fulfilled prophecy, but there's still prophecy yet to be fulfilled. But even here, Angel Gabriel saying, this is going to happen. It's going to start by a baby being born. Oh, yeah, by the way, I forgot to start like this. And you know this because I share it every year. God, heaven has, been, heaven has been silent for over 400 years at this point. When the book of Malachi ends, which is the last book of the Old Testament, and where Matthew begins, there had been a prophet for over 400 years. God had not spoken to his people. For, they had been literally wandering in darkness. And then all of a sudden, God shows up by sending an angel and says this. Pretty miraculous to think about. The divine message, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. What we see in this, this is the point of application, is God's grace is not something we earn, it's a gift. We are recipients of his grace. We are recipients of his favor. And ultimately, Mary found favor because God had chosen her to, to be the mother of his son, or to be the mother of the son of God and son of man, you and I find favor because of Christ as well. It's not in and of ourselves. It's not something we bring to the table. But when one places their faith in Christ, they come under the grace and the favor of the Lord. Are you aware of God's grace in your life this morning? As we see in this, in this beautiful narrative of, of God intervening into the human affairs was the end that lay out to just this one lady. There's, I guess, Zechariah. Well, <laughs> I just remember this. Gabriel met Zechariah, but what happened when he left the temple? The dude couldn't talk no more. 
And so he goes back to Elizabeth, and she's, they can't talk into John the Baptist. And so nobody's talking about it. Mary didn't know that Elizabeth was pregnant, and Zechariah can't tell nobody. And, and it actually says that, that Elizabeth stays, she kept to herself for five months hidden. And so nobody knows what God is moving to pieces, but nobody knows. Little did we, we'll find out is that when Mary leaves here, she walks into Elizabeth's house, who hasn't been able to talk to her husband in five months now, six months now, and says, when Mary comes in to greet, said the baby in her tummy literally leaped, which was John the Baptist. Phenomenal. That, that even, even the unborn could recognize the Savior <clears throat> there. Not to get political there, but we see that. But that God is, even though people haven't talked about it, that God is moving the pieces, and, and, and even the one who's not even born yet recognizes God's plan. <clears throat> Thirdly, the divine plan and power. Mary has a very, very good question in verse 34. Not why, but how? <laughs> how can I, because I'm not going to go and be with my future husband. I'm a God fear. I know what's right. So how, how, and I think this how is not necessarily even a question of, of doubt. It's literally, all right, make it make sense. I've never been there before. So, what we see is that God's plans are fulfilled through his power, by his strength and his power. And so Mary says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Verse 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. I'm not smart enough to explain any of that to you, but understanding this is that she did not become pregnant with child by any act of man, but by the power of God. And that's why, you ready? What does it say? That's why he will be called holy. There's a miraculous birth. There's an immaculate conception, if you will. There's, a, there's something in which she becomes pregnant, not by the will of man, not by flesh and blood, but by the very Spirit of God. So God had a divine plan. What seemed like was impossible for a virgin to become pregnant while still remaining a virgin, he's the God of the impossible. Which is what Gabriel tells her. It's not a question, I believe, of disbelief, but a genuine understanding. And so he says the Holy Spirit, there's to be a divine work beyond human comprehension. This is where we get the God-man. This is the glory and the mystery of the incarnation that we can't explain it, but God in his other thanness and intelligence and wisdom and a plan that had been predestined before the foundations of the world knew that there'd be this one in Nazareth who would bear the son of man. And then he gives, him, gives her, she give, he gives her evidence that God can do ultimately what he wants to accomplish his purpose. And what was that example? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, who was elderly at this time, who had been barren her whole life. Gabriel looks at her and says, oh yeah, and by the way, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. Not that, but she's six months pregnant at this, right now. Right here at this moment, she's six, six months pregnant. For she had been barren, and then Gabriel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. You can see from this text that God specializes in accomplishing what seems to be humanly impossible. We've seen it through this whole text, that God speaks to his people. That should be impossible. That God would choose a lowly teenager from Podunk Town, Nazareth, to use her according for his purposes. 
seems impossible. But only that before she's ever been with her future husband, that she will bear a son, and his son will be the savior of the world, and he shall be called holy. That's all impossible. Did you know that it should be impossible, not only for Mary to bear the son of God, but for you and I to know God is our heavenly father. That's how strong our sin is. Like, if you don't think that our sin is a big deal, look at the depths in which God is taking here to provide a Savior. Not only that, but like the sacrifice that happened even before the cross. What does Philippians 2 tell us? That he, being equal with God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. And that the, 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 I know I said this a few weeks ago, but that what that meant was is that for all of eternity, he had been recognized as God, but in this moment, in the moment of the incarnation, he set aside his right to be recognized as God so that Prior to his coming, an angel named Gabriel could come to a girl named Mary and Nazareth and say, hey, you're going to bear a son. His name's going to be Jesus. And so the very Son of God takes, puts society, sacrifices, if you will, for a moment and a season to be recognized as God so that he could take on flesh. Hey, see, the sacrifice of the God has started way before the cross. Obviously, when we think about the cradle and a baby, it's, oh, thank you, God. But at the same time, God, I'm sorry I'm so sinful. I'm sorry that I'm so broken. He has the power to accomplish what he purposes. What seems impossible for man is, is possible with God. Are you facing a situation that seems impossible? I know we're not, I'm not reading this ourselves. So in, I believe the way we teach the Bible, just so nobody goes home and says, Justin said, hey, we could be like Mary. Here's how we teach. There's a primary application to all Scripture. And then there's some secondary applications that we can make from the text to deduce from the text, right? Kind of like this. I will never preach when I'm preaching David and Goliath that we all could be David and slay our Goliaths on our own strength. I'll never preach that. However, what I will preach is that God can use us continue to have faith in him for him to slay the dragon giants in our life. So in this text, I'm not preaching that Mary, because of Mary, we can look at Mary and go, man, if we have faith and we can do so. What I'm saying is in this text is that we can deduce from the fact that Mary was facing an impossible situation that did not make sense on paper, but she chose to trust God, and God blessed that. You and I oftentimes can find ourselves in impossible situations. Let Mary be our example. Listen to me. If, she, if he can do the unthinkable to bring a Savior into the world in Podunk Town to a 13-year-old girl, then what's, what's impossible for him? Nothing in your life and nothing in my life. And I think that's an appropriate response response to that text. And so, application to that text. God is not limited by human circumstances or logic. So it doesn't matter what you've been told. It doesn't matter what the enemy keeps whispering. It doesn't matter how you feel or the flesh feels. He's the God of the impossible. Which brings me to my fourth point, Mary's response to the divine. Verse 38, man, look at this. She may be 13, 14, 15 years old, but look at how she responds. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Ultimately, she looked to, to Gabriel, but ultimately it's to God. God, I am your servant. Whatever your word says, well, let it be done that way. Whatever you need me for, let it be. I love that she said, let it be according to your word, as in... what. I want, I want to live out your will for my life. Whatever your word has said about me, that's what I want it to be. Let it be. Let it be in my life. I am not a servant of myself. I'm not primarily a servant of Joseph. I'm a servant of the Lord. So let it be whatever your word has, 
has willed for it to be. Man, do you see the faith in this young lady? Mary recognizes her position as a servant of God. And despite personal costs, reputation, uncertainty, and future challenges, she submits to God's will. Martin Luther said that there's, there's some great miracles in this text. There's a miracle that Gabriel showed up and talked to this girl. It's a miracle that she would conceive of, 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 of a son while still being a virgin. But the third greatest miracle, it's not the greatest, but the third miracle is, there, is that she actually believed it. That she actually trusted God at his word. That somehow, some way that she said, okay, let it be. Whatever it is, whatever it costs, whatever Joseph's going to say, whatever my family's going to say, let it be. I'm almost about to sing that song, by the way. Let it be, let it be. I was that close. Daniel, I'm not going to do it, bro. But that's what's going on in my head as I'm trying to think about what to say right now. Let it be. And her faith and surrender opened the way for God's redemptive plan to begin to unfold on the face of this earth. How often do we hesitate to obey God because of fear of uncertainty? A fear of the unknown. I wrote it like this. I think it's coming on the screen. True faith involves surrendering our plans and trusting in His. True faith involves surrendering our plans and trusting in His. That we would have a yes, Lord response to whatever it is that he calls us to. Not but, well, well, Lord, maybe, maybe you don't know what all that entails. May we be like Mary and just say, I'm a servant of the Lord. My life is not my own. Let it be to me according to whatever your will has planned. And what a response. And we don't share this as an exaltation of Mary. But we look to Mary no different than we look to Paul as an example to follow what it means to surrender to the Lord. Mary, yes, she was highly favored and she should be recognized to be the the mother of the Savior, yes. But nowhere in Scripture do I find that Mary had the power to forgive sin or give mercy. Nowhere does he hear as an intercessor of prayers. Matter of fact, the son that she was going to bear would be her only hope of salvation as well. She would have to recognize him not just as her son, but the son of the living God and believe in him. <clears throat> Wrapping up this morning, What we see from this text is that God's grace chooses the humble. That it's not out of prestige and success. It's just him being him. His power accomplishes the impossible. That there's nothing in our lives that we we may think it's impossible, but it's not impossible with him. And that his plan, require, his plan for us requires faith and surrender to his, his plan. Now, we may not know all the details or all the pieces, but we respond, just let it be. Whatever it is, let it be. I said it already, but if God can provide the Savior of the world to the virgin teen in the middle of nowhere, Galilee, what can he not do in your life? And some of you may be thinking, Justin, you don't know me, bro. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the mistakes in my life. You don't know the failures I've done. You don't know the the times I've ultimately blasphemed God and this, that, and the other. No, I don't, but you know who does? God the Father does. And he knew that even before you even did it. And he still chose to send an angel named Gabriel, (laughs) I'm going to say it again, to Nazareth, to a teenage woman, so that she could bear the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And that that baby boy would grow up to become a man. And inside his life, he would would live perfectly. 
Zero sins, zero blasphemy, zero discretion. I mean, uh, division or anything. He did nothing wrong. And what he did is he perfectly fulfilled the righteous lo- demands of the law. The very thing that say, just what does that mean? The reason we're a sinner is because we break the righteous demands of the law. He did it. He lived them perfectly. And satisfied the ultimately God's demands of the law. But then he died upon a cross, absorbing the very wrath of God for the sin that he had built up for every lawbreaker. That's all of us. We're all lawbreakers. He was not. We're all lawbreakers. But every sin built up more and more wrath, more and more anger towards it. And then that baby boy who grew up to be a man Eventually, he had 12 disciples with him. One of them betrayed him by a kiss, sold him for 30 pieces of uh, of silver. And then he was handed into the Roman soldiers, and they beat him. They falsely accused him with the Jewish courts. And then they they, they beat him, they scourged him, and they nailed him to a cross. And when he died on a cross, the, the Scripture says that he fully, fully absorbed the wrath for every lawbreaker. I think about that. Think about where there's six billion something people on the earth, planet right now, whatever it is. Think about the billions of people that have lived on the face of this earth since Adam. Every single one of them was a sinner. Think about the people who are going to be born who are not born yet. Every single one of them is a sinner. And the scripture says if we've had one sin, we're guilty of breaking all the law. When that baby who was born, that we hear about in Luke chapter 1, Whenever he lived, he died. He died for every sin that would ever be committed from Adam and even the garden to the last person who sins. He fully absorbed all of that wrath. And first John tells us that he he ultimately satisfied it so much that he, he, he pleased the Father. And the Bible says that he, he ultimately became sin. And I don't know how to sin. I say this all the time. I know how to sin, but I don't know how to become sin. What it means to become sin is that God the Father treated him as if he was every sin that had ever been committed and ever will be committed from Adam to the end. But I'm thankful that that verse doesn't end there. So that we, the lawbreakers, might become the righteousness of God in him. How do how do you become the righteous? Well, it's like this. God the Father treated God the Son as if he was every sin that ever has been, ever will be committed, so that he can treat you and I as if we have never sinned at all. And then he was placed in the tomb. And we thought maybe all hope was lost. His disciples are freaking out. They they went back. They were. And then three days later, as a matter of fact, they put put a a stone in front of the tomb. And then three days later, the Bible says it it opened up. And then then he was, they went to there early in the morning. He was no longer there that he had been risen. And, 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 and he came, and, 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 and there was an angel there, and he told the ladies, why are you looking for him here? He's not here. Why are you living, looking for the, the living among the dead? He's no longer here. And he spent some 40 days or so with his disciples, teaching them the, how he's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. The book of Acts begins like this before he commissions them to go build the church that that same Jesus who Gabriel mentioned in Luke chapter 1 that would be born of a virgin who lived, who died, who rose again. Then he, the disciples were sitting there and all of a sudden they, he began to lift up off the ground. He returned back to heaven in which angels said he was coming and now he sits back at his rightful place at the right hand of his father. And the Bible says that he alone has the power to forgive of sin. He lived the life. He died the death. 
He defeated the grave, and now he alone sits in the place and the position to say, I forgive you. So Justin, okay, all you have to do is believe and trust in him. To know that we are not good enough, smart enough, wise enough. But we say, Lord, this is what you say about me. I trust in you. Let it be. Would you trust in him this morning? Maybe you've never truly trusted in Christ for the salvation of your sins. I'm begging you on a Christmas sermon about the baby who's going to be born to trust in him, not as a baby who was born, but a risen Savior of the world. Maybe you're in here and you're like, man, I've been saved. Has the grace of God failed to stir your heart any longer? I pray that through this Christmas series that's going to be full of lights and laughter, that God would stir our hearts and remember we should be like Mary and we should be troubled in the fact that we have found favor with the Lord and that he's with us. And maybe the application for you is, man, life, life's tough right now. He's the God of the impossible. Say, let it be. Continue walking faithfully with him. If you need to pray this morning, if you want to talk, say, just I want to trust in Christ. I'll be standing right down here on the front. You can just come to us, hey, I want to trust in Christ, and I will direct you to somebody who can talk through and pray through different things with you. Maybe you need to go to somebody and say, hey, I'm just dealing with a rough time right now. Can you pray with me? You need to come down here and make the front of the stage an altar. Whatever you need to do, I pray that the Holy Spirit, as he leads us, that we will follow. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this familiar story of your gospel uh, beginning, the genesis of your gospel that we see in our time where you sent word from heaven to this young girl in Nazareth about the plan that you would accomplish. So God, we thank you for that. Now speak, move, and may we, as I prayed at the beginning of the sermon, our hearts tend to grow callous, will you soften them? Our ears begin to grow deaf, will you open them? Our eyes begin to go blind. Will you make us see? Allow us to see. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. I mean, you stand and you move as the Lord leads.